Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the last uh, biostatistics seminar of, of this semester. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to have uh, Professor Edsel Pena from uh, the University of South Carolina Statistics Department visiting us. Uh, Edsel and I go back a, a little, little ways. We have sort of Ohio connections, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about his Ohio connections in a second. Um, but Edsel also has Florida connections. So he got his PhD degree in statistics at FSU uh, in 86, working with Miles Hollander. And uh, I guess those are the days he was telling me that uh, the University of Miami were, were kind of powerhouses in football, and so they used to beat up on uh, the poor, Knoll poor Knowles. Um, he then moved to uh, Bowling Green State University in, in Ohio, and he was there for, for quite a few years uh, in, this, in the uh, Department of Mathematics and Statistics uh, to the point where he got to full professor there. He left Bowling Green in, in 2000, and he moved to the Department of Statistics at the uh, University of South Carolina in Columbia and he's been there ever since. Um, he has a wide range of interests in terms of statistical research, and I'll, I'll read you off a few of these. He's, he's interested in sort of general mathematical statistics, semi-parametric and non-parametric statistics, survival analysis, is, which is what I knew him from, reliability theory, applied probability, uh, and now he's e even getting in, involved in uh, high dimensional data analysis uh, with applications to gene microarray uh, analysis and uh, his area of biological applications, colon cancer research. Uh, he's been hugely successful in terms of the whole publication game, getting grants through NIH and NSF. He's an, a fellow of the American Statistical Association. I counted, I think, 13 PhD students that he's uh, matriculated, all of whom I think have academic positions. So it's been really, really fabulous. So it's a real pleasure to have him here. Uh, and today is talks on statistical multiple decision making, kind of an enticing title. So, welcome, Ed. My my talk is uh, really about decision making, uh, in particular about uh, multiple decision making. So here's the the outline of my talk. Then that uh, I'll start with some motivating problems, and then uh, the problem of multiple decision making, and uh, I have to do some uh, mathematical formulation there, and then we'll get into. Uh, the problem of, uh, I, I need to introduce these uh, concepts that uh, we will need. And then uh, the problem here basically that I'd like to emphasize that uh, when you are trying to make many multiple decisions, like when you're dealing with the high dimensional data, you need to be very careful. Because if you are not careful at all in that situation, you don't have control over the errors. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to show you here is some kind of economic aspect to the problem of multiple decision making. Uh, so Neil, I kind of pointed it out to him earlier. So I don't want you to say anything when I reach that portion on, uh, on how to do it. Okay, so I'm not sure if I will reach these parts here, these, uh, but I'll try to cover as much ground as I could. Okay. Now, what are the motivating questions in problems here? There are many. Multiple decision making arise in many areas. Okay, one particular case, of course, is uh, in microdata analysis, you have so many genes. Okay, in my case, for instance, there's a total of 42,000 genes that uh, my uh, collaborators are working on. And what we would like to do there is to try to determine the possibly few genes that are actually important. Okay, now you have these many, many genes, but only few of them are important, and you would like to discover that. So this is one problem where multiple decision making comes up. Uh, another one that you could have here is uh, the problem of selecting the predictors. You might have a response variable, and then you have many possible predictor variables. But you know that a lot of these predictor variables are actually not relevant at all. So the question is, how do you choose that such that you control your probabilities better? Okay. So, Survival analysis is another area that you could uh, uh, use this. And uh, that's the question, for instance, of trying to determine what are the relevant variables in terms of the lifetime. Okay? And, uh, usually in survival analysis, we are dealing with the time to an event. And consequently, you would like to choose those that will actually be predictive of that lifetime variable. In reliability or engineering, okay, this comes up too. If you have a system with many, many components, Okay, potentially many components. Which of those components are actually playing a role in that system? So, so that's again a multiple decision problem because a lot of those components might not actually be in the system. Okay, and if you try to in put them there, you might just become inefficient in the way you're doing things. Okay? 
in epidemiology, for instance, you could also use multiple decision making. Uh, if you're trying to look at the spread of a disease in a certain region, you might split this region into pieces. And then now you have the question, which of these sub-regions have the disease gotten into? Again, a multiple decision problem. Okay, so all of this, though, will turn out to be part of one general mathematical framework. And uh, there are other things, too. And of course, since uh, the Miami, Miami Heat is in the, in the heat of playing Philadelphia, isn't it? And uh, I noticed that they're 3-0 up now against Philadelphia. You could also do this in sports, okay? Like, uh, which of these teams are going to win in certain games? Okay, that's a multiple decision problem. I, I mean, I took the taxi last night from the airport. Uh, I, I was just trying to make sure that the taxi driver is bringing me to where I'm going. So I, uh, I started a conversation with him. And of course, uh, not knowing the guy, I had to focus on sports. I said, so how is the Miami Heat doing today? And uh, he said, I think they are losing. And then, of course, when I arrive in the, in the hotel, it turns out that uh, they actually won the game. So they're three and a half. Okay? So, so I'm sure that the Miami people are very happy about that. Uh, see, see the, the Clevelanders are really mad at Miami. Okay? <laughs> the first thing why they are mad is that they, lose, uh, they lost James to, uh, to Miami. Okay? But they are more mad because they lost Sunil. To, to Miami, I okay, guess. So, 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 okay. Now, here, here's the, the particular kind of focus that uh, I wanted you to, to have here. here. Here's a heat map of uh, the expression levels of genes. Actually, here I just took 100 genes out of 42,000 genes. Okay, this is from an experiment on colon cancer. And uh, there were three groups in this uh, experiment. There's a control group and then two other groups, nine days and two weeks. Uh, that's the time that they made measurements. And on this data, uh, you have five replications per gene for each of the groups. So this is group one, group two, and then group three, five replications, five replications, five replications. But there are 42,000 genes in this situation. The basic problem here is this. Out of these 42,000 genes, which one could you say are actually differentially expressed over these three groups? Okay, yeah. yellow, yellow color here means high expression, and then the red color are low expression. But now you have this very big data set, okay? Very big data set that you could examine them one at a time, okay? You basically have to do it in kind of a machine framework, <coughs> in our mathematical framework. But that's the basic setting. Find out the genes that are important from the context of these three groups. And if you find them, maybe you could focus things on them. Maybe you could develop drugs on the basis of the genes that you had, you had obtained. Of course, what you need to realize here is that uh, such a data set like this, big data set, is just incomplete or partial data. When you make a decision, certainly you're going to make possible errors of decision. We cannot avoid that as statisticians. What we would like to do, though, as statisticians, is to try to control the chances that we are actually going to make those mistakes. Okay, that's the basic game in statistics. That's why we have what we call as type 1, type 2 errors. Type 1 error is a certain type of error that we would like to control and possibly minimize the other type of error. But that's the basic framework that we are dealing with here. Here's a typical problem in variable selection. Again, you have heard the response. You have heard the predictors. M could be large, okay? But it's very possible that in this situation, a lot of these betas of J's are actually zero. And only a few of them are non-zero. What you would like to do is uh, to try to obtain those coefficients or to determine those coefficients that are actually zero. Why do you want to do that? Because if you try to fit this full model where you have many betas of J's that are actually equal to zero, then you will lose efficiency. Your variances will blow up. Bias will be OK, but variances will blow up. OK, so you lose data. Data is precious. And if you cannot use an efficient method of inference, then you are losing resources in that situation. So that's the problem in this situation. So you might then have observations on the y in the xj's, and on the basis of that, you would like to ask which of these predictor variables are actually the important predictor variables. Okay? So uh, now, typically in this situation, capital M is large, but the number of observations that you might have might be small, like in that 
microarray data. So you have the replication number small relative to the number of variables that are of interest to you. Okay? Now, uh, in survival analysis, for instance, uh, you might not even be able to observe the capital Y. What you might be able to observe are right sensor data. Maybe the capital Y are getting censored by some variable, like uh, maybe you haven't seen it yet, and then you got cut off. In that situation, you have less information, and you might only have this. And one problem that comes up there is how do you deal with this? How do you choose those variables that comes up? But technically, it's a multiple decision problem, because for each of these predictor variables, you are asking the question, are you relevant or are you not relevant? And so you have these M possible decision pro problems that are of interest to you. Now, uh, this is a description of a reliability problem, for instance, and, uh, but you could also think about that as a biological pathways problem, okay? where you have these components. You do not know how they are connected in some way. You do not know where the arrows are pointing. Okay? You do not know which ones are actually into the system. And then you have data. And what you would like to do is to reconstruct that system, possibly with less error, and then, and then come up with the components that are relevant in that situation. So, so this is another problem in which uh, this, uh, this thing comes up. Now, let's try to put this, though, in a mathematical framework. Okay? What's the problem? The problem here is that uh, you have these capital M questions. Okay? Are the variables, uh, which variables are important. And so you could kind of think about this as to discover the value of this theta vector where theta is theta 1, theta 2, up to theta sub m. Each of these thetas are either zeros or 1. Theta 1 takes the value 1 if predictor variable 1 is important. It takes the value 0 if it is not. Okay? So you then have here a vector of parameter Okay, which is taking values in the set 0, 1 to the power m. Now, in the olden days, we take m to be 2 or 3. Okay? And so there are only a few possibilities. But in this situation, this capital M is very large, 40,000. And when you think about the space in which you are choosing your value of data, that's 2 to the power m. Okay? 2 to the 100 is already very, very many. This is a very huge collection of possible values of data. And what we are trying to do is to find that value theta, that one single value of theta, out of these so many, many possible values. So it's uh, the problem about needle in a haystack somehow. Okay? So, 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 so that's why it's a complicated problem. So here's the theta m is equal to 1 means, means the component m is relevant otherwise. Now, so that's the goal. What is theta? What is that vector theta? What do we want to do then? We want to come up with an action. What is an action? That's the one that I will tell you. Okay, you're the scientist, you come to me and I say, I want to discover which genes are important. So you know that there is some data there that you're trying to discover. What you want me to do is to tell you what my action is, what I'm going to rec recommend to you. And this action will be based on the data that you give me. Okay, so that's our A, the action. And the action here is going to be also a vector, A1, A2, up to A sub M, taking values in that same set. Okay, so in AM, equals 1 means we declare that theta sub m is equal to 1, and we would usually call that as a discovery. Otherwise, we would say that am is equal to 0, which means that we would say that that component is not important. Okay, so, so this is the typical terminology that I think maybe it was the engineers or computer scientists who introduced this word discovery, but this is the game. I have this data that we do not know, okay? We would like to discover that I would like you to I would like to give you an A, which is a vector that will kind of estimate, in some sense, the theta value. The space is so big, because you have capital M large there, and then this will be based on data. Okay, so, so the problem, as stated, is very simple. Of course, what I could always do to you is I could just uh, toss coins and uh, decide on the basis of the coin tosses what my action is. But you don't want to accept that. You say, I gave you this data. Use this data to make this decision or this action. Okay. Now, so what happens? So we have the theta and we have the A. Then we have to ask the following question. If you know what theta is, let's say if you actually know what theta is, and I give you this action A, how are you going to assess whether this action is a good action or a bad action? How do you measure? the distance between the true theta and the action that I had provided you. 
okay? And so we get into the notion of losses, okay? That's uh, measuring how good the action is based on the data that I'm giving you. So there are several possible actions that uh, losses that we could use here. One possibility here is simply what we call as the family-wise error indicator. Okay, and what is this? I call that as L sub zero. A, the action, theta, the parameter that is of interest. And what this simply indicates to us is that we made at least one false discovery. Why is that? Because uh, remember theta sub m is going to be zero if uh, there is no uh, effect. And it's going to be one if it is actually relevant. A sub m is equal to one if you say discovery and consequently, if theta sub m is equal to zero, this will be one. If a sub m is equal to one, then that means that you made a false discovery. If the sum of this is at least zero, or is uh, greater than zero, then that means that you had made one, at least one false discovery. Okay? So that's what we call as the family-wise error indicator. But notice that if you have such a big number of decisions to make, maybe one false discovery is not too important. Okay? So we had changed that a little bit. We call that next uh, loss as the false discovery proportion. What is that? Again, the numerator here, okay, it's like that one there. It is the total number of false discoveries that you had made by making the action A in the theta value is given, okay? The denominator here is the total number of discoveries that you had declared. Like for instance, I have the 40,000 genes. I'll say 1,000 of these, are significant, okay, that's the sum of the A's of them. And then, but out of those 1,000, I might have committed 100 false discoveries. In that situation then, we would say that the proportion of false discoveries is going to be 100 out of 1,000. In the maximum, there is simply to remove the possibility of a zero over zero, which we could just define as equal to zero, okay? Now, so that's another one, okay, false discovery proportion. And this is actually the one that will lead us to what we call as the false discovery rate, the one that was introduced by Benjamini and Hochberg, okay, which is a very popular measure of error now in this case. Now, these two types of errors, family-wise error in false discovery proportion, could be, could, could be considered as type one errors. Type one errors are false discoveries, declaring that something is important when in reality it is not important. Okay? But there is another type of error that we need to be concerned about. It is declaring that something is not important when in reality it is important. That's what we refer to as the type of error. It's very possible, for instance, that there is a gene that is actually very relevant, but then I say, oh, that is not important. Now, why is that consequential? Maybe because I eliminated that gene for you, you might not be able to develop the appropriate drug to treat the disease. That could be a very bad error, too. At the same time, a type one error where I declare to you that something is important, when in reality it is not important, could have very bad consequences also. You could be spending millions of dollars doing research on that particular gene, when in fact it is inconsequential. Of course, it's not the drug companies that will suffer. It is the people that buys the drugs because they will just increase the prices. But then you notice that there are consequences on all these types of errors. Okay, so the second, the third type of error that I have here is what we refer to as the missed discovery proportion. What is this? The total in the denominator is the total number that you ought to discover. That's the number of relevant genes, for instance. The total in the numerator is the number of non-discoveries that you had made, okay? Because you notice that this will be one if theta sub m is one, relevant, but then you declare a m equals to zero means not relevant. So if you take the sum of those, that is the number of non false non-discoveries that you had made, and then you take the denominator there to be the total number of discoveries that you ought to consider. There are other types of type to errors that we could consider, like false non-discovery rates also are possible, but this is the one that I focus on in this situation. And that, this is what we refer to as a type to error. These two are what we refer to as type one errors, just like in the usual classical hypothesis testing where we only have one problem to decide on. Now, <laughs> life would be very easy for us, okay? Of course, it would be very sad for statisticians, if Paul, the oracle, is still alive, 
Okay, you know, Paul the Oracle was the one who who nearly caused a war between Spain and uh, Germany because uh, Paul the Oracle dis determined, in some sense, that Spain is going to win the game between Germany and that uh, thing. So, so if Paul is alive, we could just simply ask Paul, okay, who did which which genes here are important or not? Okay, so we wouldn't make any mistakes. By the way, Paul has died recently, so, so I say, if only we still have Paul, okay, in that situation, okay. Now, I say to that if Paul is, is still exists, and we could ask an oracle about what the correct decisions are, then we would all be out of jobs, because there will be no need for statisticians, okay. So, so in some sense, it's a, it's a good thing that uh, we don't have oracles in some sense, okay? But the idea is that we would like to be the oracles. In some sense, actually, we would like the statisticians to be the oracles in some sense, but with a certain chance that we are going to make mistakes. This is, by the way, the moment when uh, Paul had chosen Spain over Germany. Okay, so uh, I gave this talk one time, and there was a German there in front. He said, I really love that, but it's kind of sad. Okay, so, yeah, okay. So, so sadly or gladly then, we revert to being statisticians. And so the problem then is data is there to get discovered. I need to give you an A. So what do we do? We gather data, a big data usually, from microarrays, from Netflix, although the next Netflix data is gone. I think I think they remove it from the internet. You know that Netflix data. There was there was a contest for one million dollars to to come up with a prediction tool, uh, and I think somebody from a group from Stanford and uh, Bell Labs and so on uh, actually won the one million dollars. And some statisticians actually were into that. Maybe they are not statisticians anymore. Maybe they had flown down to Miami and enjoyed the beach somehow. Okay, but uh, but uh, you get this data. They, they took that out, by the way, because uh, they said there is confidentiality issues. That uh, somebody could pinpoint that Professor Duncan is actually the one watching all these movies, and then you didn't get your consent. You know, in a, uh, earlier I had to sign a consent here that uh, they could take my. Uh, uh, talk and put it in that camera and then put it on the internet. Uh, it's kind of scary these days because uh, if you if you notice, uh, they will put your evaluation ratings uh, in the internet without your permission, and nobody complains about it. But uh, so you, you didn't have to ask my permission to do this. Yeah. So, but but anyway. So so you have this big data which I'll just call as X, or X there could be a very big data, millions of observations and so on. But statisticians or mathematicians will just call it the X. It takes values in a certain space, which I'll call a script X, which we call as the sample space, okay? Now, this data though, okay? One thing that we deal with in statistics is that we always deal with things that are probabilistic or random in nature, okay? If I could have data that are, if, I, if that gene is, say, differentiated among the three groups, and every time I observe from group one, I get a zero. Every time I observe from group two, I get a one. Every time I observe from group three, I observe a two. Then there is no problem. I could immediately distinguish with one observation. But that's not the way it is, okay? Our data is always random, and it is following a certain probability measure or distribution. Okay, it's a cloud, okay? You have these clouds. They could be clouds, actually, but if they are very differentiated, then there is no problem. But the problem is that these probability distributions are intersecting in some sense, and consequently there are common points there, and we do not know what to do in those situations. Okay, so, so but you have this, uh, this probability measure that governs this big data X, you know, you could think of in that microarray data, for instance, remember I have rows, okay? I have rows, and I could think of X of M there as the data for the M row. In this case, for instance, X of M will be the data from the three groups for the M gene, okay? And it will be following a certain distribution, which I will simply call as PM. It could be, for instance, a multivariate normal where you have independence among the three groups, okay? Or it could be binomials, okay? Bernoulli's, for instance, okay? So, so for each XM, for each row, there is a distribution that is emanating from this big P, okay? So, in that situation. Now, the theta of M now, that was of interest to us, is nothing but a functional of that probability PM, okay? So, if, uh, if the PMs are identical for each of these groups, for instance, then I have theta equal to zero. If they are different, then I have theta equal to one. Whatever, whatever you're trying to decide. So the thetas of M, the ones that we are trying to discover, are nothing but functions of that probability measure that is governing this theta x of M, so we have this situation. As an example, for instance, uh, theta sub M, 
could be equal to 1 if and only if the piece of M is normal whose mean is equal to 0, for instance, greater than or equal to 0, for instance. And then you say that is, ah, this co that discovery. Okay, otherwise you might say that that is equal to 0. So the pointer is that the theta sub M, the parameter that is of interest to us, is a functional of the probability measure that is governing the data that we are going to see. Okay, in the data is the kind of little things that we'll see there that tells us a little bit of what P is inconsequently about what data is. Okay, so, so you yeah, have that uh, thing there. Now, next thing is uh, what is a multiple decision function? A multiple decision function now is nothing but a function from the data space into the action space. Remember the action space is the zero one to the power m. That is the script view that I have there. This is the data space. This is where the data is residing. We'll see one of them. Okay, then based on that data, we would like to come up with, with an action, and that action is determined by this delta. Okay, so the delta then, because you have a total of capital M decisions, the delta then is going to be consisting of delta 1, delta 2, up to delta sub M. Now, what are these deltas? Those are the decision functions that you use for each of these decision problems. Okay? Now, you notice that I said delta sub m here is a function from script x into 0, 1. You might ask, you, are you allowing the possibility that the decision on the m gene is depending on all the other data, not only on the m data? And that is the possibility. And what those are what we will call later as compound decision rules. Okay? So delta sub m is then this function for each of them, and so on. Now, you gather all this delta you get what you call as the space of multiple decision functions. And the basic problem from a statistical point of view is to, get, to determine the delta that we will be using to choose that from this collection of possible decision functions. Okay, and, uh, if I have given you a choice, then if you get the data, you plug that in into this decision function that will give you your action, okay? Now, equivalently, the problem here, by the way, is this. I could gather the little m's where theta sub m are equal to zero. And I could gather for you that little m where theta sub m's are equal to one. These are the relevant genes. These are the non-relevant genes. A lot of times, the cardinality of this is going to be small compared to capital M. But technically, this is the problem. What is script m sub zero and what is script m sub one? So you could put the problem in terms of deciding which of the sets there among the possible subsets is the one that is governing everything. OK, so this is a third problem. Now, another thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that uh, in these types of problems, you could have dependencies on the data. It's very possible that when two genes are actually relevant, then they, the data that you are seeing from them are going to be correlated or associated. But when the genes are not relevant, then maybe the data that you are get, get, seeing there are going to be independent of each other because it's only random type of noise somehow in that situation. So the typical assumption, which is not always the case, by the way, is that this delta sub m, when you are in script m sub 0, are independent. And then it's also independent of this case. But inside the ones that are relevant, those decision functions need not be independent of each other. You have independence for those genes that are not relevant, but they need not be independent when you are outside that collection. Okay, so these are the uh, minimal type of assumption that you have in here, but it's not always the case because you could actually put dependencies in this situation. Okay, now, next issue that comes up. So let's say that I give you a decision function delta. Okay, so I say, okay, this is the decision function that we are going to be using in this, day, in this problem. Okay, remember that the data x is random. So what we will see there is just one of those. Okay, you could be unlucky. Okay, the data that you saw might not be a very good data and you could be unlucky. So how do you evaluate things then? Now from the statistical point of view, we evaluate that by taking the average over all the possible data realizations. So you take the expectation of the losses. When you take the expectation of the losses, then you get what you call as the risk function. Okay, that's what you call as the risk function. It's the average loss that you will commit if you use delta and then that data is governed by the P, okay? So the way we are doing this is that uh, the way we, in the frequentist sense, the way we evaluate the procedure is over-repeated sampling. Of course, in the Bayesian paradigm, 
uh, we don't do that. Okay, the data speaks for itself, and then that's how we evaluate that. But in the context of classical inference, for instance, the evaluation of the procedure is over the possible realizations of your data. And so that's the risk function. And then when you have this risk function R sub zero, that's for L sub zero, that is what you call as the family-wise error rate. Uh, if you have for L sub one, when you take the average of this, that's what you call as the false discovery rate. That is the one that was introduced by Benjamin in Hochberg. And then when you take the expectation over L2, that is what you call as the missed discovery rate. Those are the averages of the errors that you could commit, okay? When you are using a decision function delta and so on. Now, when you take these expectations, these are with respect to the true probability measure that's governing your data. Of course, you don't know that. P is not known to us, okay? So, but that average is actually being taken over this P, okay? What's the goal here? The goal then is to choose that multiple decision function delta such that these risks are small, whatever P is, okay? Whatever that P is, we would like this to be small, we would like this to be small. Why? So we, the chances that we are making a mistake in our decision is as small on the average as possible for the losses that we are using to evaluate our actions. Okay, so that's the basic goal in this situation. And here's a kind of a simple, just to uh, uh, relate it to what we know in uh, the classical statistics. If you only have m is equal to 1, that means that you only have one decision to make. Okay? Then what happens there? The theta is just 0 or 1, the action is 0 or 1, the loss functions are going to be this, okay? Uh, theta is 0 and then I give you 1, then that's an error, okay? Uh, L2 is given by this one here, 1 minus A indicator, so it's going to be 1 if A is 0, but in fact you should have said 1, okay? So, so that's the situation. And then uh, X here say, has a measure or probability distribution P, which might be taking values in P0 and P1. Okay, so two, two possibilities only. Uh, this is what we call as the simple versus simple setting. When you take the risks now for a delta associated with this problem, then R0 delta theta is the probability of declaring significance when in reality it is not. So that's type one error in our basic, basic statistics. R2 delta theta is one minus this, so that becomes, notice that this is the probability that you will make the right decision given that it is actually significant. That's the power, okay? One minus that, and then, yeah, that. So, so consequently, that is the type two error, probability of a type two error in classical statistics. When you have m is equal to one. So what we basically did there, when you have now m large, the loss functions that we had is to combine all those actions that we are going to be taking. Okay, so it's a generalization of what we have. Now, for the moment, let's suppose in this case here that uh, P0 and P1 have densities F sub 0 and F1. This could be both normal, possibly different means, for instance, or different variances. So the usual framework that uh, we have. Now what do we do, okay? So as I've said earlier, the R sub 0 is a type 1 error probability. The R sub 2 is a type 2 error probability. And then uh, R2, as I pointed out earlier, is 1 minus the power. The power is the ability to detect what needs to be detected as significant, okay? So that's our power there, okay? And, uh, and so on. What's the desired goal in classical uh, framework? We would like to control the probability of a type 1 error to say an alpha, which is your level of significance in, in a, our m equals 1 case. So we say, I'll give you a 0 0.05 level of type 1, okay? Give me the best decision that you could have. And the best decision is the one that will minimize the probability of a type 2. Okay, so this, uh, this part is simply saying that uh, the optimal decision that I wanted is something that controls the type 1 error probability, but makes the probability of type 2 error as small as possible. Okay, so that's the, what we call as the Neiman person framework of optimality in, the, in that situation. Now, for this case where m is equal to 1, we know this, okay? All the students here knows this as the Neiman person lemma, okay? In what we have there to get you the optimal decision, if you have those densities F1 and F sub 0, is the following. You're going to declare that there is significance, there is discovery, if the ratio of F1 and F sub 0 is greater than a cert certain value. 
you're going to declare that there is no significance if it was the opposite. And there is a potential that you need to flip a coin to randomize, to get you exactly, say, 0 0.05. But you could ignore this part. That's the randomization part. But this is the, one of the main theorems that we have in mathematical statistics, that you could get the optimal decision by utilizing this, what we call as the most powerful decision function of Neiman in person. Now, what you should observe though here, which we don't emphasize in our basic courses, is that this procedure actually depends on the alpha, the level of significance that you had given me. So this constant C actually depends on alpha, as well as this, this depends on alpha too. Everything there depends on alpha. If I give you a 0 0.05 level, if I change that to a point and level, it's going to alter the test that you are going to use. So it's actually a function of alpha. And this is the clue to the whole problem of multiple decision problem because that leads us to the notion of what we would call as a decision process. Okay, what is a decision process to get into the more general problem? Okay, now a decision process now is simply the decision function that I'm using, but I'm going to look at that as a function of the level that you are using. So consider, for instance, the problem where I have normal data, x1, x2 up to xn, normal mu sigma square. I'm testing this hypothesis. Uh, mu is less than or equal to mu zero. We'll call that as theta is equal to zero. And then mu greater than mu zero, we'll call that as theta is equal to one. That's the one that we teach our basic uh, uh, statistics students in that case. So what do we do to test that? We use the t-test, OK? This is the t-test. We say you are going to reject the null hypothesis if this t statistic where you have the mu zero there is greater than the critical value from the t. Okay? But what you would notice in this one is that the whole thing depends on the alpha. 0 0.05 level, that changes the thing. 0.10 level, that changes the thing. Now I'm going to look at this as a function of alpha. When you look at this as a function of alpha, you get what you call as a decision process. It's now a stochastic process that is indexed by the size okay, of the test. Okay? So that's the decision process in this situation. And what do you want? The problem is that you would like the maximum type 1 error probability to be less than or equal to alpha. And then you would like to choose, under this constraint, the one that minimizes the other type of error. Okay? So that's the basic framework that we have. But uh, notice that uh, uh, it covers all of those things there. Now, Let's go now to the case where capital M is big, okay? What do you do? Now, when you now have capital M big, then you have the notion of what you call as a multiple decision process. Remember, you have capital M decisions to make now. For each of them, you will have a decision process, which we'll call as delta sub M. It could be the t-test process. For the next one, you might have another process. It could also be the t-test process. For the third one, it could be a chi-square test, but it also depends on the size. So you now have a collection of multiple of decision functions. We gather them into one big collection. We will call that as the multiple decision process. Multiple because now you have several of these things here. Okay. So a decision process for the end component then will depend on alpha, and then this is your test procedure like the t-test that I illustrated to you earlier. Okay. Now, what do we do in this situation? The typical approach here is this. Where we're going to pick a delta sub m from delta sub m at using the same alpha. You say, say give me an alpha, and then I'll give you a particular alpha value, and then I'll just pick the test based on that. Like, say, for instance, if I, in this one here, if I give you an alpha that is 0.05, then that's the test that we will use. And we will use the same type of test for all the rest. Okay, so you're using the same type of error probability for each of the tests that we'll be having. Okay, and uh, this is the most popular one these days. Uh, and, uh, and then you get into what you call, uh, say, the Bonferroni or the CDA. Now, remember that the problem in the in the multiple uh, decision uh, settings that I'll give you a type one error probability, 0 0.05. Now, but you couldn't choose 0 0.05 for each of the tests that you are going to be doing. Because if you do that, it will blow up your probability of type 1 error because of multiplicity. Bonferroni's rule, for instance, gives you that. So what you need to do to control your probability of type 1 error is to use a different alpha at each of the tests. And that will be, say, if you wanted to control it at Q, then what you need to use is Q all over capital M. So if you have 0.05, okay, Q, 
and then capital M is 40,000, this is going to be very, 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 very small. It's going to become very difficult for you to detect things there, okay? And the, the, the reason why we do that is because you want to control the probability of type 1. If you do not do that, then you don't have control on your type 1 error probability, okay? And that's one of the problems that we need to be very careful of when we have this issue of multiplicity, okay? Because uh, it blows up on us. Just with 10 tests, if you use 0.05, then your probability of committing a type 1 is not 0.05, but it is already about 0.95. So no control at all. So you have to uh, decrease that. Now, the other way that you decide on that alpha that you use for this, for instance, is you call the CDAC. Uh, this is the case when you have independence, and then you could actually compute that, and then this is the particular alpha that you should use to pick the particular decision function at each of them. In that case, you control your error probability. Okay. Now, how do you implement this? So the basic idea here, then, is that you come up with a size function. Okay, the size function, that's a function of alpha, and then it tells me what alpha I should be using. I could have, for instance, a size function that goes that way. And then if I give you an alpha, I pick the value A alpha, and then that's the size that I'm going to be using. If you just have it diagonal, then alpha of 0.05 will give you a size of 0.05. But you could have a different type of function in this equation. And for, for, for instance, the Bonferroni size function will be given by this. The CDAC size, size function will be given by this. You gather now this size functions into a collection. And then given a decision process delta in a size function A, the way we choose the particular test to utilize is then delta evaluated at that particular size function. That's for one test, OK? Now, when you now have, though, this multiple decision problem, then what you do now is you will have a collection of size functions for each m. OK? For m equals 1, I have a particular size function. m equals 2, I have another one, and so on and so forth. So this is now a multiple decision size function. You have an am for each m. And, and then the condition basically here is that you must control it at, say, a certain alpha in that situation. OK? Now, how do we proceed? If I give you a multiple decision process delta sub m, these are the tests that you will be possibly using. And I give you a multiple size decision size function given by this. Then you pick now your multiple decision functions according to this thing, delta m, a m delta alpha. OK, so for each of the m, you compute a m at alpha, and then that's how you pick your decision function. That's your multiple decision function. Now. When you, when you do this, okay, when you pick your decision function in this way, then you have what you call as the, the you usually call it as the weak family-wise error rate. The weak family-wise error rate is the probability, or, or this R sub zero, when this P has such that all the genes are not significant. Okay, so you call that as the weak family-wise error rate. And then this one turns out to be equal to this. And then that's, of course, less than or equal to alpha by, by the constraint that uh, we had put on those uh, size functions. Okay? Now, so now we have the Neiman person paradigm for m is equal to 1. But we want to use that same uh, thing when m is now large. How do we do that? So, same problem. I'm going to control now my r sub 0 to be less than or equal to q. That's a one type of error. Or control R sub 1, which is the FDR rate, the false discovery rate, to be less than or equal to Q. For P, that such that all the theta sub M are equal to 0. This is not yet the most practical one, because we know that that will not be the case. Okay, but this is the beginning of the solution. Okay, so we control this. And then when you, when you have strong control, on the other hand, by the way, that's we control. When you have strong control, you would like to do that for whatever P is. Okay? Whatever P is, you would like to have that control. But that's the more difficult problem. But the solution to this problem turns out to be tied in to the solution to the weak problem. Okay? Now, if you do this control, what you would like to do then is to make this as small as possible. That is the type to error that we have. But that is the type to error that is now measured with respect to that multiple decision action that we are making. Okay? So, so it's, a, it's the same principle. Okay? Control type 1, minimize type 2. Okay? So that's the same principle that we are using there. Now, so 
this just kind of a way to show you how, how the idea is, okay? And uh, the, the idea is that I could calculate for you this R sub zero and that is given by this one here, okay? If I, I could, if I know these thetas of m here, the thetas of m are the three states, okay? If I know them, then I could actually come up with an alpha that will make this less than or equal to Q, the control that I would like to have. If I know this one, if Paul is alive, then I could ask him what the thetas of m's are, and then I could then determine for you the alpha that I should be using, okay? So that's the problem with that because that involves thetas of m, and we could do that. But the problem is that we don't have that, okay? So, I call this as Oracle Paul's choice, okay? If we know the thetas of M, I could get you the best alpha that you should be using to pick out your test, and that is given by this formula. But the problem there is that it depends on thetas of M. I know these functions because I, I input that, okay? Although, well, later on I, I could ask, tell, ask you, tell you how to choose these particular ones to optimize. But this, prob this thing though, it still depends on the true states of the thetas of M, which I don't know. Because we do not know p, okay? So I call that as oracle poles. Right? If we know an, we have an oracle, then we actually know the truth and we know how to do that, okay? So now, but a simple solution to that is to estimate the thetas of m. How do we estimate that? Remember the deltas of m are actually the ones that will give you your action, zero or one. So I could use this now here to estimate my thetas of m, okay? It's either a zero or one function, okay? decide that's a discovery or not based on this thing, and then I could plug that in there, and then that will solve the problem. So now I have this uh, oracle's choice in some sense, or uh, estimated by this quantity, and now everything there is known to me. I could compute that. Of course, the computation is, uh, is still complicated, but it, it is, could be done because it could actually be converted to a simple formula in that situation. But this is how we come up with that alpha that you have there. So here, here's that. The chosen multiple decision function then is going to be given by this. Okay, the delta sub m evaluated at the a, a, a sub m evaluated at that alpha dagger that I had shown you. So give me the data. I give you this, then I come up, and then I take you the decision, okay? Now, here's the theorem for this particular case. Give it a delta in a, A, this is the multiple size function, the delta dagger Q defined above has control of the type one error, okay? But it need not yet optimize the type two error, but at least it controls for you the type one error rate in that situation. In that case, the family-wise error rate, because this is just for R sub zero, okay? Now, this, this also shows you, by the way, that this is for strong FWAR control. Even though I do not know P, I still guarantee you that this is going to be less than or equal to Q. So the procedure is adapting to the situation. We don't know P, but I still am able to control for you the probability, the false, uh, the family-wise error rate. Okay, and that's an important thing because it's not only we control, but it was actually derived based on the solution for the weak FWAR control. Okay, so now, you could convert all of this, by the way, to generalized p-values, okay? Remember the p-value in one dimensional testing? It is the smallest alpha value that you could have to reject the hypothesis, okay? You could also derive, uh, come up here with what you call as a generalized p-value, and that is the smallest alpha that you should use to get you a decision of discovery for the end problem. Okay, so it's just the same notion that we have there, okay? And then you could order that and uh, so on and so forth, uh, no need for that uh, thing there. Uh, and then this is for the purpose of coming up with uh, the other control, which is the false discovery rate. If you do this, okay, you could, uh, you could obtain a formula for the false discovery rate in that is given by this, okay? But you don't know that because you do not know theta sub m and then you do not know p. But again, you could come up with a heuristic here and observe that uh, this expectation is less than or equal to this, and then you come up with an alpha star, which is given by this formula. It's the largest alpha such that it satisfies this condition. The delta sub m, of course, is data dependent, so this is the largest alpha that you could satisfy this. When you use now an alpha star of this form, and then you pick out your decision functions, are using this alpha star, then you get FDR control. 
Okay, and uh, this is now the goal that Benjamin Hochberg has, okay, which is to control the FDR. But you could actually obtain that using this general framework, and then you, you get the result here that the R1 delta star alpha, okay, uh, Q is going to be less than or equal to Q, whatever P is. So strong FDR control, essentially. Okay, now, so you might be familiar with the Benjamin Hochberg, which I'll just uh, flush here, but that is a special case of this procedure, actually. Okay, uh, well, I will uh, tell you it. Okay, so, so you have this uh, situation. So here you have a class of strong FWR controlling MDFs that's given by this first one. And then you have here a class of FDR controlling MDFs that's given by the second set that you have there. And then CDAC sequential step down strong FWR controlling belongs actually to this one, while the Benjamin Hochberg belongs to the second class. So they get recovered. These are the two popular methods for controlling FWER and FDR, and they are just one element in that, part, in that general uh, thing there. Okay, so, okay. Now, uh, just to mention, by the way, this is the FDR, or the Benjamin E. Hochberg procedure. In the Benjamin E. Hochberg procedure, okay, very simple to use. What you do is you take the ordered p values. These are the p values that you obtain, and then you order them, and then you take this capital K to be the largest K that satisfies this condition. Okay, so it's very easy to implement in R, for instance, or you could also have a, a package in the R thing there, but uh, you take that, and then your decision function is given by this uh, thing. You, you decide discovery if the p value for the m test is less than or equal to p parentheses k, where k is given by this. This is data dependent, of course. These are based on the data. So, so that's the, the Benjamin e. Hosberg procedure. But the question that we had there is, is that actually the best? It turns out that it's not the best in the uh, certain situation. Okay. Okay. Uh, how, many, how many minutes do I have? So to decide where to cut here. Five minutes, okay, okay. Now here, here's an example, for instance, of uh, an application of the Benjamin Hochberg. This is the data, and I took there the data with only two groups. And uh, uh, if I apply the Benjamin Hochberg there, I get about 2,600 significant genes, okay? So, uh, of course, uh, you, you uh, go through that. And then uh, this, for instance, the p-values for the 42,000 genes, okay? That uh, you, you see, uh, you notice the bump there? I could explain that, but uh, I don't have time to explain that bump there. But uh, generally speaking, if uh, all the genes are not significant, then you would expect that this will be a flat one. These p-values here are the ones that are actually referring to significance. And in the Benjamin Hochberg, we try to pick that out. Okay, and uh, if you had chosen those genes, you could possibly choose also a smaller number. And these are, for instance, the plots of the, of the means for the two groups. And then the blue ones there are the ones that got picked out to be significant. And then the red ones are the ones that we actually analyzed further. But you could do those types of analysis after you have decided on which genes are important in that particular case. You could then do some clustering, for instance. Okay, this the this the heat map of the selected ones. You know this, of course, the separation between the groups. But uh, that's from the practical point of view. And then the biologist or the medical person will then have to go to the genes and then analyze each of those. And here's a cluster clustering of the genes that we we actually found out to be significant. Okay, so now. Uh, this is the part, though, that uh, uh, is uh, new to the whole thing. And uh, the problem that comes up there is this. Uh, could we improve the benjamin e. Hochberg procedure? Okay? See, one thing about the benjamin e. Hochberg procedure is that it does not take into account the powers of the individual tests. It only uses the p-values. But Neiman in person, in their paper, said power is germane to the whole problem of optimization. If you're going to come up with the best procedure, for decision making, you need to look into the possibilities, the other possibilities. But Benjamin E. Holzberg, a lot of the procedures that we currently have, don't take that into account. We forget about the power. Where does the power come in? Why, why are there differences in power? It could be because there are different effect sizes. It could be because a variance in one gene is bigger than a variance in another gene, and it changes the effect size that you have. In sample size determination, effect size is an important component. But we ignore that in this particular case. And so this is the problem that we ask in this situation. Could we improve these things here? And it turns out 
that you could actually improve the procedure by taking into account the power. And here's the basic idea without going into detail here. You have the power functions. The power functions get into R2. That's the second risk function. You could then try to minimize that function subject to the constraint that you have on the Typhon error probability. Okay? So, and then you get your optimal alpha. When you do that, then you come up with the optimal size that you need. And then you get a better procedure that will minimize your type to error probability with control of the type one error probability. And this is, the pro this is the problem that we have here. And then you could actually do that from the result that we had. And uh, this is just the uh, thing there. Uh, and it's, uh, the solution depends on this uh, mapping. This is the map from alpha into the power. And this, this map actually is what we refer to as the receiver operating characteristic curve. Those are the receiver operating characteristic curve, and that's the one that determines for you how to optimize in that situation. And then, and then you, I mentioned here that uh, the exchangeability assumption that we usually do for Benjamin Hilchberg is more the exception rather than the rule because there will be differences in the effect sizes or the powers of each of these individual tests. It's possible that uh, in one gene you are using a chi-square test, in another one you're using an app test. Okay, so different uh, possibilities in that case there. Okay, so this is uh, the situation. Here, here's the theorem that I just wanted you to to see. The optimal decision is obtained from this formula. This is the derivative of the power, and consequently what you want to do is to choose the sizes for each of the genes, for instance, the AMs, such that you satisfy this constraint subject to this constraint here. And uh, this comes out from Lagrange's uh, multiplier optimization, but it's a very, very simple one. And what it is basically telling you is that the optimal decision actually depends on the derivative of this ROZ function. Now remember the derivative of the ROZ function is telling you how much power you're going to gain by improve, increasing alpha. If you, if you increase alpha, if I give you more error possibility, then that will increase your power. But the important thing is the incremental increase there. But other than that, though, it must still be attenuated by how much you have already used. Okay, so you notice the term there, 1 minus AM. If I have already given you too much type 1 error, then it will penalize you. Okay, so there is the rate of change in the power, but then where are you now in the scale of the type 1 error probability? And uh, this is the basic solution to the thing there. Here, here's a simple example just to illustrate that. This is the power function, for instance, in this case where you have normal. But uh, this is the one that I wanted to show you. Okay. This is the case for the normal, for instance. This is the distribution of effect sizes. Okay. Not all uniform. Uh, so lots of them are close to zero, but there are some large ones. This is the effect size. This is the optimal size that you should use for the test. Okay, if the effect size is 4, then you should use a big size. If the effect size is uh, 12, then you shouldn't use a big size in that situation. And then this is the power that you achieve, this comparison of tests, okay? So the point there is that you shouldn't be using the same test for each of the tests that you will be uh, implementing in the thing there. Now, here, here's the lesson to this one here. See, one of the problems when I started doing this is I said, what do I need to do if I need to optimize the test. Should I, give the, should I give the error probabilities to the ones that are performing the best? Okay? Or should I give it to the ones that are performing lowest? I was thinking that I should give it to the best performing tests because there I say I'll discover with certainty. But it turns out, to my surprise, mathematically, that it wasn't the case. The lesson is that do not invest your size on those where you will not make discoveries or those that you will certainly make discoveries. What you need to do is to invest your size in the middle portion. Okay, that's that uh, plot that you see here. No size there, no size. Put the sizes in the middle portion. Okay, and why is that? It's like investing, okay? If you have eyes, you're investing in stocks, you want to put it on those in which the rate of increase if you invest there will be good. Okay, but here's a more wicked consequence of this one here, and I was telling this to Sunil. I said, I give you $10,000, Sunil, to allocate for merit increases to your faculty, for instance. Whom should you give it? Okay, should you give it to the top performing guys? Or should you give it to the lowest performing guys? 
If you give it to the lowest performing guys, you will not get anything for it. If you give it to the top one, you knew that they were going to discover things anyway. But if you give it to the middle one, you will get the best differential effect in that situation. So that, it's kind of interestingly, it leads to a way in which you should distribute your merit increase. Of course, we hate it because we all work very hard. Yeah, so, yeah. But here's a much more interesting one for the graduate students. If your advisor doesn't want to talk to you anymore, you, you, uh, you make an appointment to your advisor and he says, oh, come back next week. Okay, you come back next week, he says, come back next week, I'm busy. There are only two possibilities. Either that you are working your butt very hard already. Okay, you're the top there now. That says, there's no point talking to this guy. Or you are not working hard at all. To the extent that he says, if I spend another hour with this uh, student, there's no effect. So he, he wants to invest his time to those that are in the middle. Because those are the ones that will get the best result. And so in some sense, when you think about this problem, it's a decision-making problem, but it's allocation of resources. It's actually an economic problem. I give him a maximum level of type 1 error probability of 0.05, okay? How is he going to allocate this to all these capital M decisions for the big department to get the best, okay? That's the, that's the, the essence of the solution there. And it was very surprising because I didn't believe it in the beginning, and I kept looking for my error. I said, something is wrong with this solution. And then later it dawned on me that I said, it does make sense, isn't it? And of course, after you do the simulation, it does make sense, okay? So here's, for instance, a comparison of the BH and then the new procedure that we had. This is the control, okay? So that's for the BH is this one. We wanted the control to be 10%. All of them are below 10%. This is the MDR. These are parameters in the simulation. And then you notice that this one is always smaller than this one here. And so, and so you actually improve the procedure by making this differential allocation of the sizes, okay? Uh, this is the, another set of uh, simulation. And then you also notice that thing there, okay? So, so you actually improve, except that in the solution so far that we have here, I'm assuming that I know the effect sizes. Most probably we don't know that. And in fact, the medical people should be the one to tell us what effect sizes are you thinking? But then if you have 10,000 of these genes, it is going to be very difficult to do that. So one of the goals that we have here is actually to do this adaptively. Maybe the data could tell us, maybe a training data could tell us about the proper effect size. But then errors comes in. Now I have to consider the potential of errors in that situation. But, but it at least tells us how to proceed if I knew the effect sizes, how to allocate the sizes in that situation. And so, so I'll conclude here by uh, simply putting this, and these are existing problems that we have here. Uh, and there are many methods that we could compare this, but there are a lot of other problems still that we need to consider. And in fact, one of my students uh, who will be joining the Florida International uh, approached this problem from a Bayesian po point of view. And I'm getting more and more convinced that that is the right way to go, that, that it's a Bayesian approach. And maybe this procedure that we actually came up with from a very classical framework will just fall out as a Bayesian empirical based procedure. But, but uh, in a sense, it gives us a way to, to deal with the, the thing there. And uh, I think I'll uh, just acknowledge my student, Wensong. She's the one joining FIU this August. And then uh, he was also my former student. Uh, he's at uh, Oklahoma State now, graduated last year. The data actually came from my wife. Uh, she's a biologist. And so she asks me to analyze their data. And of course, I always tell her that I am completely unbribable. Yeah, so <laughs> I said I'm a statistician and I couldn't be bribed. Okay, so when, when she tells me one time that she said, uh, you know, one of the mice hasn't died yet. And she said, do you think if it died, I will get a significant result? And I have to be very careful. I have to examine that she doesn't kill that mice. Wow, so, yeah. so <laughs> it's hard to be working to a biologist or a medical person somehow. They never know what they're going to do, you know. And uh, the first lesson that she had from me is about randomization. I had to instill in them that randomization, uh, random allocation of units into the different groups is actually a crucial component in the design of experiments. Uh, because uh, at one time she had me analyze this data and uh, they were comparing to the uh, treatment group in the control group. And I noticed that the, only, the, the weights of the two groups were completely different, that you couldn't determine anything. 
And I said, how did you allocate these mice, by the way? I said, oh, we just look at it and then put this group there and then put this group there. I said, I will not analyze this data. You have to repeat the experiment. Of course, they, they don't like it, but uh, they, you, have to, you have to insist those uh, and so on. So, uh, but uh, they have these uh, uh, experiments there. And then that's where the microarray came. And uh, this paper, actually, it, it was more a theoretical paper, as you might have noticed. It came out in the annals just this uh, February. It used to be the first version of it was uh, 55 pages, and uh, they wouldn't touch it. They kept saying, they reduce this. And finally, the editor said, OK, if you reduce it to 30 pages, and then put all the technicalities in uh, an online appendix, then we will accept it. And, uh, what could you do? Yeah, so, so but, uh, it, it's there if you want to see it. But uh, the, the interesting thing about it is that you could actually optimize certain things there. Okay? You could optimize certain things by using the power. And in some sense, it kind of extends the problem that Niemann in person had solved, which is power is intrinsic if you are looking for optimality. And we had ignored that in this multiple decision setting. And I think this is kind of one way in which this actually comes in. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs>